This is Chthonia, the world of the dark feminine. Welcome to Chthonia, the podcast dealing with the dark feminine. I'm your host, Breach Burke, and this week we are going to continue our look at Japanese folklore and look at the kitsune, uh, particularly the kitsune suki, which um, kitsune is an archaic word for fox or having to deal with uh, spirits that take the appearance of foxes. And the suki part of that um, and I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but it's T-S-U-K-I, at least is how it's transliterated, um, has to do with the idea of uh, possession by a fox. Uh, now, foxes are interesting creatures in myth and folklore because foxes tend to be part of what Jung would call the trickster archetype. And the trickster, as we know, is an extremely liminal figure. Um, the fox, uh, well, the trickster in general is a, is a figure on the boundary. Uh, between uh, heaven and earth, or between the underworld and, and this life, uh, this world and the other world, um, they, they tend to represent this state of being neither here nor there. And this is often um, you know, this is often conveyed by the fact that these beings are often shapeshifters. So, uh, so foxes um, in these, this particular type of fox or fox spirit um, is one that actually can shapeshift. So, I want to talk about these creatures today, and I'm going to do uh, really cover it sort of three different categories. One is going to be the fox as trickster, okay, as, as a trickster figure. Um, although, I also want to talk a little bit, at least give one story of the fox uh, fox spirit as being a trickster, but as being a helpful trickster. Because sometimes they're a trickster in a, a negative way, um, and other times they are a trickster in, you know, in a helpful way. So I'm going I'm to give examples of those two kinds of stories. And then we want to talk specifically about um, the, uh, the uh, kitsune that, it, that um, has its role as a, uh, as a fox that takes the form of a woman, usually to be a seductress or a lover. Um, the idea of the fox lover is is very common. You see it in a lot of stories. And so I'm going to give a couple of those stories. And also, the fox, uh, back to the kitsune uh, suki, this idea of the fox as bringing, as possessing a woman and therefore bringing madness of some kind. Uh, in fact, there's a, a frequent association with, um, you know, the idea of someone who is experiencing schizophrenia or similar state as being what they call fox-possessed. Okay. So let's begin. Let's start with um, the the legends. I want to <clears throat> give a little bit of a of a background, and of course, I've just turned to Wikipedia because there's a fairly comprehensive um, definition here. Uh, Kitsune are intelligent foxes that possess paranormal abilities that increase as they get older and wiser. According to yokai folklore, all foxes have the ability to shape shift into human form. While some folk tales speak of Kitsune enjoy employing this ability to trick others as foxes often do. Others portray them as faithful guardians, friends, and lovers. Uh, so there's, they note here that there's, um, that foxes and humans lived close together, so therefore this companionship uh, gave rise to many legends about them. And uh, they said the more tales that it has, because obviously the, t <laughs> the multiple tales would be an indication of their supernatural origin, uh, the more wiser and more powerful that it is. Um, Although they also mentioned that during the Edo period, 1603 to 1867, they were thought of as goblins that could not be trusted, similar to badgers and cats in um, Japanese thinking. Okay, so let's um, now. I should mind. I should note that that this is again kitsune is the archaic word for fox. There is a more modern Japanese word for fox, but uh, this is this is a specific reference to that uh, that archaic use. Um, now, some of their characteristics, it says they're believed to possess superior intelligence, long life, and magical powers. They're a type of what they call yokai. The word kitsune is sometimes translated as fox spirit, which is actually a broader category. This does not mean that they are ghosts, I'm going to say not ghosts necessarily, nor that they are fundamentally different from regular foxes, because the word spirits are used to reflect a state of knowledge or enlightenment. Long-lived foxes were believed to gain supernatural abilities. 
and they ref they talk about two classifications, the Zenko and the Yako. The Zenko being benevolent foxes or Inari foxes, um, and the other Yako uh, field foxes, which could be mischievous. Um, and they say there's a Ninko, which is an invisible fox spirit that humans can only perceive when it possesses them. Okay. So, um, okay, so let's, okay, so yeah, so one of their characteristics, as I mentioned, is that of shape-shifting. Uh, they might take on human form. Um, well, and, and as we're going to see, they can take on other forms as well. As a common prerequisite for the transformation, fox must place reeds, a leaf, or a skull over its head. Um, common forms assumed by kitsune include beautiful women, young girls, elderly men, and less often young boys. Um, foxes, I, I would say that women seem to, while there are obviously male fox spirits, it does seem that women uh, predominate in this. And it says it's not limited by the fox's own age or gender. And a kitsune can also duplicate the appearance of a specific person. And they're particularly renowned for impersonating beautiful women. Okay. Um, okay, so the kitsune suki says that this means the, uh, the state of being possessed by a fox. Uh, and it's usually a young woman. They said the fox enters beneath her fingernails or through her breasts. Um, I'm going to talk about the Kitsune Suki um, after, but I want to start by talking about the fox as trickster. So I'm going to give two, two different stories. Both are from uh, books I have of Japanese folk tales. Uh, one is literally called Japanese Folk Tales. Uh, let me see who the, the author is of this one. Uh, by Kunio Yanagita. And this was put out in Tokyo. It's an English translation, but it was put out in, in Tokyo. And this first one I'm going to read to you is called Kangoin and the Fox. Long ago, there was a mountain priest who was an aesthetic called Kangoin. He had been away on a trip and was returning full of good spirits to his village after a long absence. In the shade of a small hill by the entrance of the village, he discovered a fox taking a nap comfortably. Kangoin went, over, went in stealthily over by the sleeping fox, and putting the conch shell he was carrying by its ear, he blew a blast. The fox leaped up in fright, falling over himself as he ran away into the grass in the distance to hide. All this mortified the fox very much, and he promptly plotted his revenge. It happened on that evening of the following day, aesthetics were to have a meeting in town, and Kongoin, who had just returned, was to attend. The mountain priests from all directions gathered together. Along the road which led them into the town, they saw a strange sight. A fox, which seemed unaware that men were passing, was standing at the edge of a pond. While he gazed into the watery mirror, he repeatedly put grass or twigs on his head and across his shoulders. Looking on and wondering what he was going to do, the priests presently saw him shake his body briskly, and a twinkling he changed into the form of Congo Inn. Then with hurried steps, <clears throat> he went off somewhere and hid. That damnable fox, they all exclaimed. He is doing that, intending to come along soon and fool us. If he comes, we will catch him and give him smoking with pine needles. The priests all got ready, were on the watch for him. Now the true Congo Inn, not dreaming of such a thing, arrived at the meeting place a little late. Welcome, Congo Inn, welcome, they all greeted him together. They took him by the hands and pulled him into the middle of their circle. The young priests began feeling his buttocks for his tail and pulling his ears. Before he had time to ask what they were up to, someone brought out a rope, coiled it around him, and struck him. Then they fired up a big heap of pine needles and smoked him until he could scarcely breathe. Congo Inn, realizing they suspected him of being a masquerading fox, gave them all kinds of proof to show he wasn't a fox until a crowd untied him at last. It was probably all because he had frightened the innocent fox with his conch shell while on the way home the day before. The fox had resented it and revenged himself by deliberately pretending to become Congo Inn so that they would all rough handle him. From that day, Congo Inn resolved he would never blow a conch shell if he ever found a fox taking a nap. Okay, so this is one way in which the kitsune can um, behave in such a way that they, um, you know, you know, somebody does them a bad, you know, tries to trick them or do them a, um, a bad turn um, by, um, you know, blowing the shell in his ear and scaring him half to death. So he says, okay, fine, I'll, I'll show you. And he goes back and he will, um, he gets him in a different way. So the other one, this next one I want to read to you is called The Good Fortune Kettle. Um... And this is from Folk Tales of Japan, edited by Keigo Seiki. I think I read from this uh, in the last episode. Um, and this is a, car uh, a class of tale um, known as uh, the motif of animals grateful for release from captivity. 
Uh, so I'll read this one quickly. In a certain place there lived an old man and his wife. They were very poor. The old man would go to the mountains every day and cut firewood, and then take it to the village and sell it, and that is how they lived from day to day. One day when the old man went to the mountain as usual, he saw three of the village boys had caught a fox and were about to kill it. He scolded the boys, saying, Here, here, what are you boys doing? You shouldn't be treating an animal so cruelly. Why don't you sell it to me? And he gave each of them one hundred mong. The boys were delighted and cried, Really? Then we will sell it to you. And they handed over the end of the rope, which is around the fox's neck. Oh, how pitiful, how pitiful, said the old man, and he led the fox to the mountains. I don't know which mountain you have come from, but after this you shouldn't go near the village in broad daylight. You must be careful not to be caught by those boys again. Now you'd better hurry back to your den. And he carefully let the fox loose in the middle of the thicket. The next day the old man went again to the mountains. There the fox from the day before came up to him and said, Grandfather, Grandfather, you saved my life yesterday when I was in great danger. I am more thankful than I can tell. Why, you were the fox that I helped yesterday, the old, said the old man. I didn't expect to receive anything from you for that. That isn't why I helped you. You look so pitiful I wanted to help you, but I don't need any reward for it. You are only an animal, and you've said thank you. That is plenty. But more important than that, if you come to a place like this, the boys from the village will catch you again. Now hurry and go back to your den. The fox, tears falling from its eyes, crept up to the old man and said, Grandfather, Grandfather, I have something to tell you. At the temple in the village below here, they have no tea kettle, and they want one very badly. Now I will turn myself into a kettle, and although it will be rather heavy, you must take the kettle and sell it to the priest. This way you will get some money. Will you do that, Grandfather? Then the fox curled his tail around himself, rolled around three times, and turned into a splendid copper kettle. The old man tapped the rim of the kettle and rang, gong, with a good metallic clang. Since the fox had turned himself into the kettle, the old man couldn't very well just leave it there, so he put it on his shoulders and went to the temple. This kettle belongs to my ancestors, but now I must sell it, he said. As soon as the priest saw it, he wanted to have it. It is a valuable kettle. Please let me have it for this, said the priest, and gave the old man three royal. The old man had never seen so much money before. He put the three royo in his purse and returned home full of joy. The priest was delighted to have a kettle he liked so much. He called the temple acolytes and said, Take this kettle and polish it with sand. We will have a stove maker come tomorrow and make us a stove. The acolytes rolled the kettle to the back door and, taking some sand, began polishing it vigorously. Goshi, goshi, scratch, scratch. When they did that, the kettle cried, Boys, it hurts me. Boys, it hurts me. Please polish softly. The acolytes were greatly surprised and ran to the temple kitchen shouting, Priest sama, priest sama, that kettle talks. What, said the priest, that's just the ringing sound the kettle makes. It just sounded like words to you. It is a good kettle and has various kinds of sounds, but if you want to, bring it back in the kitchen and leave it there. The acolytes were still a bit fearful, but did as the priest had asked. They rolled in the kettle in the river bank up to the kitchen and left it there. That night the kettle disappeared, not a trace of it could be found anywhere. The priest was greatly disappointed, saying over and over again that since it was such a good kettle, a thief must have come during the night and stolen it. The old man, knowing nothing of what had happened, went to the mountains again the next day. There again he met the fox, who said, Good morning, Grandfather. Yesterday at the temple, the acolytes used sand to polish me, and I got some rough treatment. Today I will turn myself into your daughter. Please go to town and buy combs, a set of hair ornaments, a sash, towels, and an apron, and some tabby for me. If you do that, I will become a beautiful girl, and you can take me to the house of prostitution in town and sell me for a lot of money. Please hurry, please hurry. Since the fox had asked him to, the old man set off immediately into town and bought the things he had been requested to get. He then returned to the mountain. Grandfather, you came back so soon, cried the fox, and I like everything you bought so much. Oh, how interesting. Now I will turn myself into a girl. Please watch. Saying this, the fox whirled around three times and turned into a beautiful young girl. The old man took the girl and went to town with the house of prostitution. This is my daughter, he said. What would you like to buy her? The owner of the house wanted the girl, so he gave the old man 100 rio for her. Taking the bag of money, the old man returned home. At the house of prostitution, the girl became very popular and earned her master a great deal of money. The next year, at one of the holidays, the girl went to the master and said, Since I have come here, I have not had home to see my parents at all. I would like to go and see them now. Please may I have one day off. The master realized that what she said was true. He gave her a great number of presents for her parents, and she left for her home village. After that, she never went back to the house of prostitution. The master said that the girl had already made many times more money than he had paid for her, and if she were tired of being a prostitute, there was nothing he could do about it. He did not even send anyone to bring her back. The old man went to the mountains one day, and the fox again came to him and said, Grandfather, Grandfather, we haven't met for a long time. Are you well? I have been at the house of prostitution in town, but I got tired of it, so I have been resting. I have almost completely recuperated now, so I would like to repay your kindness one more time. This time I shall become a horse. Please take the horse to a rich man in some distant country and sell it. This is the very best thing I can do for you. If things go badly for me, I may never see you again. 
So if that happens, please observe today is the anniversary of my death. Please think of me once in a while and burn some incense for me. Well, now I shall become a horse. Please stop, cried the old man. You have taken care of me time after time. I no longer live so poorly as before. I have everything I need, but you do not need to do anything more for me. But even as the old man was talking, the fox became a splendid gray horse. Since there was nothing else the old man could do, he took the horse to a rich man in a distant country and sold it for 100 rio. He then took the money and returned home. Shortly after this, there was to be a festival. The gray horse, who had been a fox, was saddled with a huge chest upon which a nobleman rode, and they set off across a long, long mountain pass. Despite his appearance, the gray horse was still actually a fox. He soon reached the end of his strength and could go no further. A crowd of men saw this and said, See what happens when a horse is not used to such work. Soon the fox horse fell in its tracks. This horse is good for nothing, they cried, and threw it into a swamp. They transferred the nobleman and the baggage onto another horse and continued across the mountain. After they had left, the fox horse got up and went off somewhere. He was never seen again. Having become rich because of the fox's kindness, the old man became known in his neighborhood as the happiness and prosperity Choja. The old man never forgot the fox's last wish. In his mansion, he built a splendid chapel where on the 19th day of each month, he and the old woman would go and pray for the fox's rebirth in paradise. Okay. So you have two fox tails there, shape-shifting fox tails. Um, and as you can see, the, the sex of the fox is not really clear in either one of those stories. Okay, we don't know whether the fox is supposed to be male or female. We do see in the one tale that the fox, um, sh you know, shape, tries to shape-shift into this uh, priest acolyte who is male. And then the second story um, shifts into being a kettle, shifts into being the daughter of this man. And then also shifts into being uh, a horse. So we we have this. Um, you definitely see this idea of fox as a uh, trickster and shapeshifter. Um, no, hang on a second here. Okay. Um, yeah, I have. Um, oh, sorry, I have uh, having a little bit of uh, mouse technical difficulties here. Okay. So let me see. Um, okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, these. Uh, what I wanted to get into next was the. Um, well, I want to talk a little bit about tricksters. I'm just trying to find my spot here. I, you know, I got thrown off a little bit by this. So uh, so apologies for that. Um, so it says. Um, Okay, the kitsune are often presented as tricksters with motives that vary from mischief to malevolence, or as we see in some cases, it's mischievous, but it, it's beneficial. Stories tell of kitsune playing tricks on an overly proud samurai, greedy merchants, and boastful commoners, while crueler ones abuse poor tradesmen and farmers or devout Buddhist monks. The victims are usually men, women, or possessed instead. For example, kitsune are thought to employ their kitsune bee to lead travelers astray in the manner of the will-o'-the-wisp. Um, which, if you don't know what the Will of the Wisp is, it's a kind of um, set of glowing lights that you often see in, in marshy swamplands and, and so forth. Um, and it's said to be sort of spirits, forest spirits of some kind, or, or fairies or something that are trying to lead you um, astray and get you lost. Um, another tactic is for the kitsune to confess its, confuse its target with illusions or visions. Other common goals of trickster kitsune include seduction, theft of food, humiliation, or vengeance. Okay. Um, there's a traditional game called Kitsune Ken. Uh, it references the Kitsune's power over human beings. Similar to rock, paper, scissors, but the three hand positions signify a fox, a hunter, and a village headman. The headman beats the hunter, whom he outranks. The hunter beats the fox, whom he shoots. The fox beats the headman, whom he bewitches. Um, so it's... Um, so, you know, so we, so we see these different, um, these different characteristics. Um, okay, just reading on a little more here. As yokai, who kitsune do not share human morality, and a kitsune who's adopted a house in this manner may, for example, bring its host money or other items it's stolen from the neighbors. Accordingly, common households thought to be harbor kitsune are treated with suspicion. Oddly, samurai families were often reputed to share similar arrangements with kitsune, but these foxes were considered zenko, which as we know are the, the, the um, beneficial foxes, and use of their magic as a sign of prestige. Abandoned homes were common haunts for kitsune. One 12th century story tells of a minister moving into an old mansion only to discover a family of foxes living there. They first try to scare him away, then claim the house has been ours for many years and we wish to re register a vigorous protest. Uh, the man refuses and the foxes resign themselves to moving into an abandoned lot nearby. I think I have seen the extended version of this story. 
Um, but it is a kind of ghost story where the foxes appear in these kind of ghostly uh, guises. Um, now I want to talk um, next, before I get into the, the possession theme, into the idea of kitsune as wives and lovers. Okay. Um, so this is, talks about um, the kitsune that takes the form of a human woman. And one of the um, more popular stories, which I'm going to read from an old book that I have, an old Time Life book. It's a very simplified version of the story, but I have it here. Um, the story of the fox maiden. And I'm going to, this is a woman called uh, Tamama no Me. And she, is, she was considered to be, uh, she, she's very um, well known in folklore as, as, this, um, as an example of this fox maiden. So I'll read this to you. Silky furred, bright eyed, wily, and sweetly mocking, uh, the ki little kitsune, foxes of Japan, were both loved and feared by mortals. Some kitsune served the harvest god, and these were honored. At the god's shady roadside shrines and in his mighty temple compound stood hosts of pretty foxes carved in stone and adorned with jeweled eyes. But most kitsune were evil beasts that could assume the shape of beautiful women and rob mortal men of vigor and goodness. Among such malevolent kitsune, the most powerful and enduring was Tamamo no Mei. In her human guise, she was a courtesan, so exquisite and skilled that she was called the Jewel Maiden. Her victims were kings and emperors. Tamamo's origins were obscure. It was thought that, thousands of years before she arrived in Japan, she had been an Indian king's consort, appearing at times as a woman and other times as a white fox with nine tails. As either, she was heartless. Her chief pleasure was the slaughter of innocents. Eventually, she was expelled from India. Legend said that the fox woman next appeared in China uh, in the harem of the Shang tyrant, Cho Sin. To satisfy her extravagant tastes, the besotted emperor cr created vast pleasure gardens whose lakes were filled with wine and whose trees were hung with baskets of delicacies. Knowing that she would appreciate a fillip of humiliation, he commanded the ladies of his court to dance nude among the flowers of, of these gardens for her amusement. They refused, so Chu Sin devised a better entertainment. He forced the women into a pit filled with vipers and bees. As Tamamo remarked in her soft voice, the ladies danced quite briskly then. They died in agony. The dissipation of the Chinese court became so constant and egregious that the people at last revolted against the scandal. Tamamo was executed and her body burned. From the ashes sprang a snowy fox, swift as the wind it made for Japan. In the court of the rising sun, Tamamo took woman's form again and seduced Toba, emperor of Japan. He steadily weakened in her company. Finally, during a night of storms, he fell into a swoon, calling her name. At that, a nimbus of triumphant light played around Tamamo's head. The emperor's counselors saw it and recognized what she must be. They exposed Tamamo's nature by holding a mirror before her face. The glass reflected not the countenance of a woman, but the white furred muzzle of a fox. Um, by this, the evil magic was broken. The woman reverted to fox form and streaked away among the pavilions of the palace. For some days, the creature lingered near, killing small animals and birds when it could, when, until the people set their dogs on it. The fox then fled retreating to the sulfur-smoking moor of Nasu in the central part of the island of Honshu, where the owls sang all night in long mournful chorus and the jackals whined on the wind. There the kitsune dwindled to a stone, it was said, and lay solitary in sullen grandeur on the plain. Nothing that touched the stone or even approached it survived the experience. It cast a miasma so venomous that insects and birds littered the ground nearby. Poets said only clouds could fly over Sesoseki, a name that meant stone of life destruction. Okay, so so we see this um, we see this interesting lack of morality, so a, a quality that I've actually seen in um, that I've always said is I've associated with very ancient gods, and so the fox spirits are definitely very um, ancient nature spirits, and in, and as nature spirits they are um, they, they you know and, and they're and these they're these kind of liminal. Um, figures that, that are pranksters in some way. They're deceivers, certainly, because they take on the illusion or the form of something else. Um, there's some, uh, just some other story, just some other um, detail from Wikipedia here. Uh, kitsune commonly portrayed as lovers, usually in stories involving a young human male and a kitsune who takes the form of a woman. She may be a seductress, but these stories are more often romantic in nature. Typically, the young man unknowingly marries the fox who proves a devoted wife. The man eventually discovers the fox's true nature, and the fox wife is forced to leave him. In some cases, 
The husband wakes as if from a dream, filthy, disoriented, and far from home. He must then return to confront his abandoned family in shame. And, by the way, this is something that very similar to what you often see in fairy lore in the West. You have this idea of, you know, being deceived into that you're, you're into this, this place and, um, you know, you, you think you're either in this beautiful marriage or beautiful place or having this beautiful celebration and then all of a sudden you wake up, you know, dirty, naked, somewhere where you're, you're, you don't know where you are. Um, so there's definitely a sense of like throwing what they call a glamour uh, over things here. Um, they talk of Kitsune marrying one another. Rain falling from a clear sky, a sun shower, is called Kitsune no Yomeri, or the Kitsune wedding. Okay, which is interesting. That's, that's kind of a, um, there's, there's your, uh, your sunshine and clear day mixed with rain. That, almost, that reminds me, I always think of the temperance tarot card. When I think of that, this kind of mixing of fire and water. So, again, there's that liminal, there's that, that boundary idea. Um, so it's, uh, it's considered to be a good omen, but uh, the Kitsune will seek revenge on uninvited guests. Um, so, okay, so we have this, um, this idea. So I want to talk a little bit about the archetype here first, and then I'm going to talk about um, the Kitsune Suki. Uh, the trickster, um, I'm reading this now from um, a site called Shaman's Way. Um, I have a lot of stuff on the trickster, and I actually have another another piece I want to read briefly, because uh, the fox certainly does fit into the archetype of trickster, if for nothing else than, you know, first of all, for its nature of playing pranks or or deceiving people, but also its shape-shifting forms. Okay. Um, now, here's the interesting thing. As they note, and they're not the only ones to note this, uh, George Hansen's book on paranormal, uh, tricksters and the paranormal also mentions this. Most traditions, the trickster is often portrayed as male. One of the few female tricksters is the kitsune. Yeah, most tricksters are male uh, in folklore. Um, they're, they're male figures. Uh, the god Hermaeus, for example. Uh, Dionysus has a trickster element to him. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, myths of, of, say, the coyotes and so forth in Native American lore, um, frequently we are talking about a male creature of some kind. Um, in this one, the kitsune is the shape-shifting fox. Okay. Um, now, they say here, the trickster survives as a character archetype, not necessarily supernatural or divine, therefore described as a stock character. So you do see a lot of the fox or fox-like characters, not only from not only the kitsune, but others in, in a lot of folk tales and fables. In mythology, the trickster is a god, yet not. It's the wise fool who rebels against authority, pokes fun at the overly serious, creates convoluted schemes that may or may not work, plays with the laws of the universe, and is sometimes their own worst enemy. One of the roles of the trickster is to question and to cause us to question. Uh, and as Hansen mentions in his book, also to um, destabilize structure. So um, you think about this. You think about the nature of something that um, makes you believe something that it isn't. The, the idea is to not make you so sure of yourself, not make you show, you know, we, a lot of times we feel very sure of what we know things are, of what we think of as real, and what the world is actually like. You know, we, we have this, we have these ideas about, you know, the way things are and how, th you know, how things are supposed to be and how others should be. We have a lot of judgments. We have a lot of ideas about what we have as a, you know, having control over ourselves and over our environment. And the trickster figure comes in, we, we dread the trickster figure because the trickster figure turns everything upside down and everything that you thought that you were so certain of something um, gets, you know, flushed down the toilet. Um, as they mention here, tricksters can be cunning, foolish, or both. They can often be funny, even when considered sacred or performing important cultural tax, tasks. Um, and sometimes they are culture heroes. For example, Prometheus in Greek mythology stole fire and gave it to humans. Okay, so a lot of times the lesson of the trickster has to do, it, it teaches us to, to listen to our inner voices, to focus on our intuitive knowing, and not rely only so much on rationality, on that heavy masculine rationality. And that's what makes it, almost, even though usually it's portrayed as a masculine character, we see this as a very feminine trait, because it's telling you to rely on what's felt rather than on what can be, say, scientifically proven, or what may necessarily, um, you know, have evidence or fit in what we think of as the rational world. Um, and that's, you know, in this day and age, it's not a very popular view, not a popular view among academics, certainly. And it's not, um, 
it's something, you know, we tend to, even those people who are not, we tend to view religiosity sometimes as being crazy, and sometimes it is. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. But traditional religion also tends to be overly rational in its forms. It's very rule-bound, and it's, you know, it's very much about following certain laws and rules. Um, this is about throwing the rules out the window. Um, I want to read Jung's little piece, a little bit of Jung's uh, piece on the trickster. And this is interesting because he relates it to the anima archetype, he says. And this is in his, um, <clears throat> um, his essay on the archetype of the trickster. Uh, if we take the trickster as a parallel of the individual shadow, which of course is all the things that you hide about yourself, <clears throat> all the parts of you that don't follow the rules, uh, among other things, then the question arises is whether that trend towards meaning which we saw in the trickster myth, can also be observed in subjective and personal shadow. Since the shadow frequently appears in phenomenology of dreams as a well-defined figure, we can answer this question positively. The shadow, although by definition a negative figure, sometimes has certain clearly discernible traits and associations, which point to quite a different background. It is as though he were hiding the meaningful contents under an unprepossessing exterior. Experience confirms this, and what's more important, the things that are hidden usually consist increasingly of numinous figures. The one standing closest behind the shadow is the anima, who is endowed with considerable powers of fascination and possession. She often appears in rather too youthful form and hides in her turn a powerful archetype of the wise old man. Aha, so what do we say about the foxes? They're these kind of beautiful, seductive, feminine figures, which is at least one very common attribute of the, the anima, or the, the male soul. And, um, but also there's this idea of the wisdom behind it as evidenced by these foxes with multiple tails. Okay, and the tales, of course, representing um, this, this kind of power and wisdom. Um, the series could be extended, but it would be pointless to do so, as psychologically one only understands what one has experienced oneself. The concepts of complex psychology are, in essence, not intellectual formulations, but names for certain areas of experience. Though they can be, descri as they, though they can be described, they remain dead and irrepresentable to anyone who has not experienced them. Thus, I have noticed that people usually not have much difficulty in picturing what is meant by the shadow, even if they would have preferred a bit of Latin or Greek jargon that sounds more quote-unquote scientific. But it costs them enormous difficulties to understand what the anima is. Okay, they accept her easily enough when she appears in novels or as a film star, but she's not understood at all when it comes to seeing the role she plays in their own lives, because she sums up everything a man can never get the better of and never finishes coping with. Therefore, it remains in a perpetual state of emotionality which must not be touched. Okay. So here we see this relationship of the fox, not only to the trickster, but to the anima, at least in the case of the Japanese kitsune. Now, this psychological interpretation leads us to the one, the, one of our focuses here, which is the, um, let me find it up here. Um, let's find my notes. The kitsune suki, okay? And that, as I mentioned, is the state of being possessed. Now, uh, it says the victim, um, okay, there's the young woman. They said that you can often see the kitsune underneath her skin. Once it's entered her body, it says the victim's facial expressions are said to change in ways that resemble those of a fox. Japanese tradition holds that fox possession can cause illiterate victims to temporarily gain the ability to read. Uh, this sound almost sounds like a kind of demonic possession, as we would talk about it in the West. Though foxes in folklore can possess a person of their own will, Kitsune Suki is often attributed to the malign intents of hereditary fox employers. Uh, folklorist... Uh, Lafcadio Hearn describes the condition in glimpses of unfamiliar Japan. Strange is the madness of those whom demon foxes enter. Sometimes they run naked shouting through the streets. Sometimes they lie down and froth at the mouth and yelp as a fox yelps. And on some part of the body the possessed, of the possessed, a moving lump appears under the skin, which seems to have a life of its own. Prick it with a needle and it glides instantly to another place. By no grasp can it be so tightly compressed in a strong hand that it will not slip from under the fingers. Possessed folk are also said to speak and write languages of which they were totally ignorant prior to possession. They eat only what foxes are believed to like, uh, tofu, aburaje, uh, azugameshi, etc., and they eat a great deal, alleging that not they, but the possessing foxes, are hungry. And it's said once they're freed from the possession, they would never begin, again be able to eat those things. I'm not sure I would eat those now. But um, they said in order to get rid of a fox spirit, you have to have an exorcism at an Inari shrine. If the priest was not available or the exorcism failed, victims might be badly burned or beaten in hopes of driving out the fox spirits. And a whole family thought to be possessed might be ostracized from the community. And in Japan, um, um, Kitsunasuki was described as a disease 
in the early Heian period and remained a common diagnosis for mental illness until the early 20th century. Um, in fact, I have uh, from Marie-Louise von Franz's book on shadow and evil in fairy tales. Um, just open up my note here. Uh, she mentions here in this one chapter, she says, Ernest von Bales, a doctor in Tokyo, described the case of a Japanese schizophrenic woman who had a fox ghost. She came from a little village. She was in a catatonic state, stupid and heavy. She would sit in a corner by herself and after a time would say, now it is coming. And from her chest, a voice would begin to bark, becoming louder and louder. Then her eyes would become brilliant and shining and she would be very, become very amusing and witty and would tell every doctor off. She would bring out all sorts of home truths, which were absolutely correct. Everybody feared her. Then after a time, the barking would begin again and the outburst would die down and she would become a stupid person that she was before. And now Von Franz calls this a case of schizophrenia, um, which, it, you know, um, the definition of that is, is probably very different now than what it was um, then. But schizophrenia in psychoanalysis is often defined as a state where you are um, outside of the, the boundaries of the control of the ego. So... In a sense, one is sort of drowning in this ocean of, of archetypes, and so you therefore are possessed by this, this archetype. The barking is interesting because I've heard other cases not related to fox possession of women who start barking, and it's, um, and usually it is associated with other kinds of mental illness or mental repression of some kind, um, you know, where, where one, for example, has experienced a great trauma and then suddenly begins barking for no reason. And this, um, but this to me demonstrates the power of, of the archetype because, you know, we, we talk about archetypes and kind of what Jung just said in that piece, we talk about it in very abstract form, like, oh, sure, I can talk about the shadow. I know what that is. Oh, trickster. Yeah, sure. Anima. Sure. You know? Oh yeah. You know, movie star. Yeah. Great. But we don't really know it until we experience it. And oftentimes we don't want to experience it because experience it is a psychosis. Um, this is why my one book of short stories is called Archetype Possession, because even though not all the stories are specifically about that, many of them are about the way um, in which the archetype, you know, gets warped or goes wrong. Um, but, you know, but, but speaking of the, um, but, but, but this particular kind of a thing, you see this, um, the, the Japanese fox woman as a kind of anima figure. Um, she is... Uh, you know, she's, she represents this, um, I mean, almost, almost entirely, in fact, almost more anima than trickster, because uh, as we noted, tricksters tend to be male. And it's not that there, there isn't a tricksterish element there, but the qualities are more, um, it's more, you know, the, the, some of these stories, it's more about seduction. And for the woman, it, it um, you know, when you have these women who are possessed by these foxes, um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's something that, that, that takes them out of the bounds of, of whatever their normal social uh, order is and puts them in contact, uh, with the archetype. Now, I don't know if, because women are not said to have an anima, they're said to have an animus. Um, the fact that they can make very accurate judgments, for instance, would be a reflection of the animus. Um, so it almost becomes a, um, a psychosis of the soul. Of some of some sort, and that possession of the woman by a fox, um, you know, there's there. That, I mean, that there, that could also be. I don't want to say a euphemism exactly, but you could almost see it as a representational term for a woman who behaves in a way that's more like the negative anima, okay, um, who takes on that role of fox as the one who has control over the men, as the one who is the seducer as the one who can, um, you know, who, who deceives, uh, rather than the woman, you know, although you, you see these fox um, wives who are devote, devo um, devoted and obedient in, in their traditional role. But what always happens in these, in the end, they're recognized as foxes, and they go away. And where, what is the man left with? He's left, you know, like I said, sometimes stories, he's left dirty naked in a field somewhere. So this idea that you've had... It's almost like it's almost like the um, a commentary on the on the nature of women, how one can easily be deceived by somebody who is who appears to be you know obedient and submissive. That there's always this other side that um, quote unquote is a possession from somewhere. Okay, 
Now, whether there are really such spirits, I mean, I've, again, I, I always, I'm always of a mindset that um, anything that we talk about psychologically is, is also possible um, as some kind of a, man, a legit manifestation of, of something. Um, because, um, again, it's back to the idea of experience. There, there is a whole other world to be experienced that if you have what um, in some psychoanalytical and even neurological thinking is someone what they call thick boundaries. If you're somebody um, who has very thickly bound nerves, you are somebody who probably does not um, experience anything that kind. But if you have thin boundaries, uh, like um, I know I do for sure, and there's many people um, who do, they may experience things that other people don't. And because of that, um, you know, people who are over, overly rational just say, oh, all of that's nonsense. There can only be this, this, and this. But, um, but the fact remains that, you know, there, there's... Um, there's much more to nature and there's much more to the universe than what meets the eye. And so, you know, the, the idea that there are other certain types of consciousnesses, the other kinds of beings um, that take on a certain form, whether they be natural forces, whether they be, whether they have kind of an autonomy or a personality of their own, um, very likely that they do. Um, because certainly we can, um, I think of the egregore, you can, you, you can make something, you, you can, um, you can create uh, an idea you can you can put an you know something together uh, just through thought that ends up cre having a reality of its own, um, and that's an entirely different subject. Something I'm actually hoping to start. You know, I'm starting a writing project on that um, on that concept, but um, but not to not to drift into that at this podcast. But um, but nonetheless, we I, I would submit that this um, these fox beings. So first of all, they're not all malevolent. Um, they do represent a kind of deception. And whether they're good or evil can, you know, in some cases depend on our subjective uh, thinking. Um, and as an archetypal representation, it's not only the trickster, but I think in case of these uh, female foxes of Japan, that they are also um, a representation of the anima figure in all of its complexity. Because it's very difficult to pin the anima down. Um, it, it, it can be, um, the anima can be very, very helpful, and the anima can also, um, can be very deceptive. And, and the anima is seductive and, free, and frequently something that's, um, that's unreal and just out of reach in a lot of cases. And when women behave in a, in a way that's associated with the anima um, in, that, in that way, in that archetypal way, or they, they become a manifestation of whatever's projected there, um, you know, they, you know they, they, they appear at least to the person observing them, the man observing them, usually if we're talking man, woman, heteronormative, um, you know, that they, they become this seductive creature. Whether in fact they really are that or not, that's how they are perceived by the person because the person's only seeing the anima. They're not seeing the real person. Um, I talk about this in my, when I talk about love mythology, is the idea of, you know, the anima is, is that, that figure that is projected. Um, and so that's why a man might see you and think, oh, you're wonderful, you're perfect, you're this and you're that. And uh, then all of a sudden one day, if the projection's withdrawn or something wakes them up to the fact that you're not the projection, then they may suddenly lose interest. And then, or you have men who will get married and then go around continually looking for that image elsewhere because the image always has an allure. Um, that may also be, by the way, another part of these fox stories, the idea that they have wives and families and then are seduced and taken away by a fox maiden. Um, that is definitely a quality of the anima. It's that, that elusive, um, perfect feminine that is always being sought after, or it certainly appears. But as, the, as, this, as this mythological symbol implies, um, it's an illusion. It's not, you're not really going to, there is no, really no such thing. Um, kind of like falling in love. You can experience what you think of as that ecstasy for a period of time, but it's not something that's an ongoing, continuous state. And similarly, with these, um, with these kinds of, they're they're an embodiment of something that's archetypal. And in that that sense alone, whether there are really such things as fox spirits or not, um, there's definitely um, an uncon. They, they definitely exist as um, as these archetypal anima figures. So that's all I'm going to say on this subject for today. I have a couple more episodes on uh, Japanese mythology, Japanese and Chinese mythology that I'm going to get into in the next couple of episodes. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Um, please visit my website, cathonia.net. 
to see what, um, you know, the latest about uh, my publications, um, for the, you know, to look at the, the full list of podcasts. This podcast is available on Spreaker, but you can download it anywhere. And of course, there's always the YouTube version. I want to thank, I've had a lot more subscribers in, in the last, um, got in the last six months. And so I want to thank everybody for, um, you know, for their interest and for becoming involved. And uh, for those who have subscribed on Patreon, if you'd like to, I'm at patreon.com slash Cthonia. Um, so if you would like, you know, anybody wants to support my work, I very much appreciate it. Um, I should have in the next, uh, before the end of the year, I should have a lot uh, more new, some new content um, and new, uh, new news to share about uh, what's going on with Cthonia. It's a lot to manage, and I've been managing a lot of it by myself, um, you know, without, without any additional people to, to do any editing or um, promoting or, you know, any other kind of work. So basically what you get is all what I'm able to do. Um, in between my, my full-time job and everything else. So, um, so I am, uh, so I'm, I'm doing my best for everybody if I can. Um, but hopefully, hopefully in the future as, as, as things build up, I will be in a position to, to have more help, uh, with all of this. Um, and I'll be able to offer more and to, um, you know, uh, and, and to provide not only the new podcast content, but, uh, some other publications, and also I know I've had a lot of requests for classes. I, I, I would like to get that up and running hopefully by this fall. So uh, that's it for me for now. Um, thank you again, and until the next episode.